recognize the skills, the style, maybe the era. This is Scott's first pipe you ever made. Uh, first pipe. Yeah. Some of us have our first pipe. Not all, many of them look like this. <laughs> I was so, it was so, it was so tight, and I thought it was gone. And I, my buddy was uh, up snowboarding at our local mountain, and he was talking to his buddy, and he was like, "Hey." I got this old dry piece that if, if uh, Scott will trade me a ball rig for it, I'll, I'll totally, I'll, I'll, I'll trade him. And I was like, and I didn't know what it was. And so I was like, oh yeah, to, and so I gave him a ball rig. And then he came out with my first pipe. I was like, oh my God. And I literally <laughs> cried. It was fucking, it was, it was like, you know, it was 15 years later or something, you know? It was like, it was, yeah, it was amazing. And did you actually have any idea what the hell you were doing when you made that thing? Uh, to yes, I was trying to imitate uh, Eric, AK. Like uh, I was, I was collecting. Um, uh, actually, uh, Delene and Clinton were boyfriend and girlfriend at the time. Actually, and I was buying cases of their glass. Like it was both of them, um, and then I would keep the like nicest piece out of there and, and sell the rest of the collection. And uh, and I did that a couple times, so I had a, a couple like really nice pieces. But then I uh, I met one of their friends, Eric A A K. Well, actually, I mean, I yeah, right then, but I was getting a couple of the same thing, and I got like a case of glass and was able to sell it. And so I just had these couple of A K pieces, and I was like, it was I was like, I, that's what I want to make. And so this is like. It, People are familiar with his work around that time. This does not look like it, but it is a, uh, <laughs> it's a, it's a trying to be. It was, yeah, it was the, the first one trying to be, but it's so much inspiration and love for all of those schoolers. Yeah. So you, you don't mind if we leave the door? Okay, cool. Well, Jason, get started then. Yeah. So we do appreciate you all coming here to hang out with us and have this little conversation. This is uh, definitely for myself. I've been blowing glass for 22 years. And I've uh, looked up to Scott my entire career. And uh, so we're excited to have Scott here and with Shelbo and uh, just having this conversation. And uh, I always, with my podcast that I have, I always like to ask my artists their superhero origin story and uh, how you were introduced to glass. The, the glass. <laughs> it was, uh, it, it was, I mean, it was obviously me, Miss Mary Jane, and my and my love for her. <laughs> and uh, but it was uh, the Grateful Dead, actually, and and uh, I was on lot, and my brother came back to camp with uh, this little spoon, and it was like silver fume with this like s swirled through it, and it had a little. Uh, Mushroom Millie on the side, and it was, and you know, and it was, you know, it wasn't blue at first, but by the end of the day, that thing was like, just, and it colored in, and it was like, it was the most beautiful thing ever, and we were just so high and looking at this thing and just talking about how, you know, like, like how maybe it was made, and we were talking about like the mushroom on the side, and we're like, how did they get that in there? How did they get that in there? You know, and everybody's got their theories and stuff, and and I'm looking at it, and I'm like. You know, it looks like one side was hot and the other, and it was cold over here, and they stabbed this thing into it, and then it like mushroomed back into the thing, and you know, and it was like, and it was just, it was, it was really cool because that's how you do it, and yeah. and it was just. Uh, what year was that? That was ninety four three. Okay, so it's ninety three. You run into your first blown glass pipe at a dead show. And how long until you touch touch glass with your hands? Um, probably about thirty six hours. I was like, I like literally on on the way home. I like uh, before I even got to my house, uh, we I went by uh, this Fred Myers, and I knew they had these map gas torches there, and I was like, and I didn't know if it was gonna melt it or not or like what, but I bought this map gas torch and. There's a, there might have been a little meth problem where I grew up, and so there was this store that had all these like long glass tubes. Scientific tubing. Scientific tubing. <laughs> <laughs> With a rose. <laughs> and so 
I went and I got a piece of like, it was probably about you know, 16, 19 mil, light wall, standard wall tubing, and, uh, and I just got home and I set up the torch in the, on the coffee table and I, and I just made this little like peanut spoon looking thing, trying to imitate the, the, the thing that I saw, you know, and then I like pushed the bowl and stuff and, and I was like, oh wait, there's not a bowl hole in a bowl push, what you uh, use? Some random object. Yeah, I, 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 I do not remember, but it was, it was obviously really random. And I like pushed it, but then it, I was like, oh, but there's no hole in it. <laughs> I was like, uh, oh, you gotta put the hole in it before you push it. You know, so I saw someone use a it out. bowl push. They use the back of the crescent wrench as their first bowl push. <laughs> wow. Anyway, so when when you ended up using the map gas, that was your first time touching it, doing some glass blowing, and yeah. Making some objects, did those crack? Did they last? Uh, they, they did. They, they lasted. I, got I, I made them. three. I made like, yeah. I made three nice. little like spoons. My buddy like Fimo wrapped like two of them, and and so we we had these couple pieces. But then I never uh, got back into whatever. It was it, it wasn't so easy. So, so now it's uh, the map gas was your first torch. I got a question here. We we fielded <laughs> questions from the public. Thank you everybody who submitted. This one's from the internet. Any advice for a noob on a Red Max trying to make it in the glass world? What's your advice? Get that map gas torch. No, I would say, I would, I would say sell your mini Red Max, you know, and buy a Herbert Arnold or a GTT, which honestly what, what I would say. I, I think uh, the Herbert Arnold is definitely the best beginner torch, you know? it's. Uh, the heat on it is so uh, it's so even and not so ferocious that you have a little more time to like deal and juggle with it and stuff. But it actually will really get it hot. So I just feel it's a it's a little, it's easier, you know, in the beginning. So, yeah. Expensive, but yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And you can get any size flame, you know, because it has the, the manifold. So you can go from the total laser all the way to the fat one, all the way back to the laser. Yeah. You have it all right there. Did That's you go right. from map gas to Herbie? <laughs> no. No, I, no, I, no. And then the map, no, I went, my first torch was a um, Carlisle. Yeah. And it was because the guy I learned from had a Carlisle and GTT wasn't a thing then. And I... It's, it's the only torch, torch I've ever heard of at, at that point, you know. Right. So, so you get your Carlisle. What year is that? That is ninety-eight. Okay, so nineteen ninety. So it was a long time between. Like, I, it's not like I started blowing glass then. I was, you know, I had to go on a tour and party for a while. I don't know if you <laughs> but then, but then I eventually, uh, you know, I was not walking the straightest line you know and i and i had a i had a kid and i just wanted to make sure that i was always gonna be there for him so i just needed to walk a little straighter line you know like i could but i didn't want to be like mainstream and i didn't want to like do it like everybody else had did it, done it you know and so like uh the, the glass thing because it, it was illegal at the time but it wasn't like so illegal that i felt like Paranoid or anything from it, so it was like uh, I don't know. It was it was my calling. Well, I got a question from Marble Slinger. He says, "How would you describe what it was like blowing glass pipes in 1998 to a young pipe maker today?" And he also says, "What's up from Thailand?" <laughs> uh, so a lot of these people, they might not have even been born when you started blowing glass making pipes. What would you? You know, describe that era of pipe making to someone who is a young pipe pipe maker today. It was it was, it was really uh, there were magical times, eh? but it was like I'm saying that like I I like needed that like alternative type. Uh, not mainstream thing, and it just felt it, it felt like I was doing that, you know. And it was so unexplored. There was just like I just feel so lucky that I got into it so early because there was so many 
uh, like nothing had been done. <laughs> I'm just I yeah. mean, like everything that I like. It was a fresh, yeah. unexplored territory. It was. It was so. It was so awesome and like new things is what really gets me off. And so everything was new, you know. And there was so many directions to go. So it was. How many um, pipe makers were you surrounded by when you were starting at NIU? Um, I, so. Uh, well, yeah, yeah, a, a handful. I like um, before I moved to Washington in '98 is when I moved there. Um, I had because I'd been you know I'd been collecting the glass, so I was like into it. And like some of my homies had started blowing glass, and um, uh, Jeremiah Newman, that, that fucking my guy. That's that's my guy that got me into blowing glass, and he uh, he moved when I moved to Washington. He moved up there maybe three months afterwards and he set up in my garage um, just opened the door and the table there with the torch on there and uh, and he was blowing and stuff while he was like looking for a house because he was moving up there and so it was all set up out there and I went out there one night and I was watching him and he had a piece of dichro sitting there and it had this big scratch across it and I was like, oh, and I was like, is this just like a layer on there then? And and he's like, yeah, it's just a layer. And I was like, huh. And I and inside I had uh, these Coca Pelli stencils and some etching cream that I had uh, around just one of our cups from the kitchen had like put these Coca Pellis like etched them into it. And so I was like, huh, I wonder if that'll etch that off. And so I like put this Coca Pelli on there and. And, and etched it off, and it like totally took all the shit off, totally clean. I was like, holy cool. And then, so I had this little piece of dichro with the Coke Capelli on it. I was like, all right, well, I got another piece of dichro and put a dichro to dichro together, and then just held it with tweezers and held it in the torch and kind of melted the one end of it, and then squished it with this little masher thing, and then punnied up to it and kind of melted it all together, and then like scissored it around, and then put a piece of cobalt around it and put a little hoop on it and fucking made this like, like little pendant that fucking, that I honestly thought was gone forever. I mean, so meant to bring it, but I thought it was gone and I didn't see it for like over like eight years and we'd moved like a bunch of times and then one time I laid this box and I opened it up and I opened this thing and it was sitting there. I was like, oh Amazing. my God, it was like, so, it's like so you actually saved that. Yeah, so oh, yeah. I, I meant to bring it, but so of course the class was broken. Before you had your Carlisle, but after the map gas, you did the Dichro Coca Cola. Uh, well, it was that preceding the map gas. No, no, this was between the map gas and yeah. me making the decision to actually be a glass blower, you know, so, and that and, and that was, you know, that was a little bit of fuel for the fire because I like I like had this really close call in my life and almost got into a bunch of trouble, like literally a week after that, and I had to make some decisions and be like, okay. All right, I I need to do certain things, and so what are you going to do with your life then? You know, because you, you ain't going to jail, you know. So I was like, so I was going to blow glass. And well, that's a good segue into the fact that right after you started, shortly, you know, time passed and Operation Pipe Dreams happened, and it affected a bunch of people who were in the industry long before we were. The people who laid the you know, footwork, footwork to, to really yeah. get the new generation of independent artists that was blossoming in the late 90s and early 2000s. So in the early 2000s, what was your working environment as you really picked up your speed of developing and your innovation? Um, it, I mean, well, I, I had I had a shop for the first probably year two the first two years with uh, the guy that got me into it Jeremiah and uh, and then I had a shop by myself in my garage for probably four years and then we and then Nebula me and um, Ivan and Brock Marvel and. Um, uh, Chris McElroy and just some other old school like Sagan was there for a little while and that, that was a really it was a really cool cool sh cool shop and a, and a cool beginning I can't imagine, yeah. but but but, but wow. my, was that Bellingham? yeah that was Bellingham and 
and there was um, so Marcel lived up there, and Ezra, and uh, Brian Decker, and uh, they, Brian Kirkfleet. Yeah, Brian Kirkfleet actually was the. Um, I've taken two class two classes in my life, and one of them was from. Brian Kirkfleet, we just got together a group of us, and because he lives in Bellingham, we just hit him up and was like, hey, if we get four or five people together, will you give us a little goblet so I can class? And so that was in like, you know, 2000. That's amazing. Four. So what I'm curious about though, so you see this mushroom on the side of the pipe, right, the first piece you see. He obviously had some kind of, I guess, not, I guess exploration and way things are made, or just like in your head, like trying to figure out the process. And then, the, and sure as shit, was actually the way it was made, you know, that I've come to find out. So before that, did you have any art background to yourself, like, and sort of as far as like a creative goes? Because as we know you now, in the, the last 10 years of like innovation that's happened, and having that future for it, you know. Yeah, thought. did you know that you were going to excel at Glass Point because you already were excelling in like, art? It, yeah, then you take this little dichro chip and you're like, hey, I can do this, you know? It's, it's fascinating. No, but I. No, I didn't actually. I didn't do much, much art. I drew, uh, I drew a, li a little bit, but I didn't get, I didn't get too into it. And okay. it really, it really was the glass that like, bring all of that. That was your medium. Me. It was my medium. Yeah. It was like, and that that was that was the thing. It, like you know, that first time that I like saw that and being able to understand before I understood anything about glass like actually understand how that was done really enabled me to learn from everybody and every single thing that I ever saw then was like, I mean, it, it's part of the reason that I didn't take like classes and stuff because I could look at something and I could see how it was done and a, a lot of times, or I would see in my head how you would do it and a lot of times and then I started finding out that those things actually weren't how they did it, and it was a way better way to do it. <laughs> totally. made a better product in the end, Absolutely. you know? And so I really did, I kind of discovered that sometimes um, not knowing how to do something and not having anybody show you and just experimenting with it, trying to figure it out is actually the best way to, to, to do things, you know, and to actually come up with some new awesomeness you know so so you might have just answered the next question but maybe you can elaborate on it this one comes from salt he asks what made you so driven to push things past the status quo of your time of beginning and why and I'm gonna follow that up with did you consciously know or was it subconscious because you're somewhat of a natural as you stumbled into it became full-time glass worker these things just started unfolding before you, or were you aware? Um, no, I don't. I don't feel I was aware. I feel I was. Um, I was following what was feeling good, honestly, and and it just what felt good is what I wanted to make. And so a lot of times it wasn't something that I had done before, you know. So it really enabled me to like develop lots of skills in a super broad spectrum that then when it, like once you have those then you just have this whole palette of tricks to to combine and do anything with it's the like, uh, glass jack of all trades yeah, yeah totally you know and and i i really want to give um marcel a shout out for it i mean he did this piece in 2000 um this uh fish i think he called it or whatever but there was a there's these dolphins and this whole entire sea scene that that really Project Thirty Three. Uh pre Project Thirty Three stuff. It was I think that was the origin of it when he got all those glass boards together to do that. Oh no 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 not that one. That 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 thing that, that thing's huge. Yeah, yeah this, I know this was his very about. first uh, um, like big crazy piece. He bring it to New Year's um, on the East Coast up to the fish show and they were all like ribbing it like inside the show and stuff and it's just like this oh, yeah. huge crazy uh, man rays and dolphins and it was like something to do with the band each guy was a dolphin and he had this whole entire like thing but what that piece did is it opened my mind up to like 
anything's possible. It's like, holy shit, damn, why can't they, really? This is the way this thing works, we can literally, anything you fucking imagine you can do. I like, yeah. and I was amazing, like, right? I was, yeah, I was like, I was like, thanks dude. I was like, so then I was like, all right, well, what do I want to imagine, you know? And I was just like, and so I like, I mean, obviously I'm gonna, I'm gonna semi imitate what I just seen. So I like did this like, you know, like one of my only like full seascaped uh, things after that, you know, with like all the creatures and everything, but that was so like his, yeah, he just enabled me to like, just take it to this level that I didn't even know existed. So. And that was around the time that glasspipes.org started. Cause I know like Operation Pipe Dreams happened and then glasspipes.org was like, fuck you, we're gonna still show you this incredible art being made in the pipe stand. And that became like this place for all of us artists, you know, me being in Florida, away from, so far away from everybody else, having the opportunity to see this work. And then seeing you on there, and I'm like, okay, time to sell my torch. I'm done, you know? <laughs> and seeing the color work, you know, stuff coming out. So it's just interesting what grows, you know, from certain things happening in the industry. Especially as yourself, as an artist, and, and your circle of influence that you have too at the studio. Pretty, it's pretty awesome. Do you brush your teeth with your right or left hand? <laughs> um, both, both. I try to I try to use my left hand on. more because it's less coordinated. Just to have the coordination, it's, it's do it with the glass one too. I like I like still I I try to do it in the most uncomfortable uncoordinated way that I can while the glass is like stiffer and harder and it's not flopping all around and then as soon as it becomes whatever then I flip and I go to the old faithful that I'm like rock solid with and I know nothing's gonna go wrong you know and then I and I, and I use that you know but then it's starting to get hard again now you can you now you can like go back to like some just exercising different muscles and being coordinated in all things is so it's so good for you like skill wise but even and brain more wise. yeah and brain wise but even more important like health wise and how hard it is on your wrist and like your whole entire body, the more different positions that you can get in and be blowing like this, blowing like this and like doing all that, it makes sense. Yeah. That was, Night that was and my follow up to that. Night like and how you're doing, because I know myself and a lot of us that have been doing this for so long, our hands hurt, wrists yeah. hurt, you know, so all this stuff that you're doing, like how you, how you handle it you know, physically. Yeah, I, you know, there was actually, there was a few years ago that I was, it, I was pretty fucking, it was, I was feeling pretty not so good about my shoulders and my wrists and stuff and I was actually having some severe, severe problems and uh, yeah, trying to hold glass and you're like putting the glass in there just like wedging it in there and holding it like with one finger all like weird and shit and but now like through um, just a little bit like a little bit of exercise and actually it's been more of a mental thing than anything that I was like, I was feeling like this weight of the world kind of thing on my shoulder a little bit and like taking on like too much and it literally was like coming out of my body of manifesting physically in, in my shit, you know? And when I like got my mental shit together, it really it like healed my body it was yeah, like i thought i was not going to be able to like really like like do this and i was like and, and i was it was pretty shitty for a second but it's so it's a it's right in here and you can like uh it's you can super feel better. important <laughs> super crucial to pay attention to and anybody out here who's in their first couple years i hope you just listen to that because we might so nice like some yourself. old folks nice. out here being like, oh, my back, but it's <laughs> the real deal. Glass blowing is hard on your body, it's hard on your mind, and if you don't have both those things in balance, you are definitely going to yeah, be... Yeah, get the fuck out of the studio and do something else besides <laughs> yeah, blowing glass. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Old Pusher submitted a question on the what? internet. Drew, what up? Uh, do you do your own stunts or do you use a body double? <laughs> Perfect follow-up to that health plan. Depends on uh, how fun or dangerous they are. <laughs> I'll do the fun ones. I got a pretty good stunt double though. So let's take it back a little bit. Um, I'm curious about the beginning of your career in pipe making. How was your support from your parents and family and friends in choosing this? 
as a career path. You mentioned you had just become a, a new parent. So uh, those things kind of end up happening to a lot of us in the industry. Shout out to all the glass parents out there. It's hard, but you're doing a great job. And how is your family relationship? Did they know? Did you have to keep the secret? Uh, no, they, I, I definitely didn't have to keep a secret, but there, there was a, so I was raised Mormon, so, you know, they're not going to totally super approve of that too much, but they, they kind of saw the path that I was on, which wasn't, definitely wasn't a Mormon path already, and so anything I feel that was, uh, progress and anything that I was really, like, into, they were, they were, they were really supportive of it, you know, even though uh, it might have not have went right along with their thing, but they already knew that I wasn't doing that, so they, it, it was, it was cool, it was, it was fine, and I felt, I felt super supported, you know, and uh, yeah, it was, that's it was, awesome, it was good. Is, is there something that you learned down the road that you wished you knew when you first started melting, and you know, if you could. Do, I mean, the, do the go back in time, talk to yourself, give yourself a pep talk, or tell anybody here who's in their beginning stages. Uh, just something that hit you down the road a ways that you absolutely wouldn't have known in that first phase. I mean, definitely the uh, the physical stuff that, like, really listen to your bodies, you know, and if it hurts, stop doing it, you know, like, like give your wrist or your shoulders or, like, whatever is, like, ailing you, because when you keep doing it, it just, it, it's going to make some problems in, in the long run, you know, so really being able to um, change the position that you're blowing and like, don't just sit, stand, sit, do all, like, do everything that you can to have a variety of things and it really, uh, it really helps. And do a variety of techniques, don't get stuck in doing something, you know, it, like, uh, like, I know a lot of people want to have this, like, thing, and they want to be known for this, and, like, if you don't, like, do, like, the same thing, then it's hard to, like, get known, you know, and that helps you sell shit when you're known and stuff, and, but, I mean, I don't know, I mean, maybe it's just me, but if you really, like, go inside yourself, that stuff, doing the same thing doesn't feel as good as, like, creating something new, you know, and so, um, just trying to switch it up and not get in the rut of just that almighty dollar and just try to do what actually feels good to you, you know, and what's actually like fueling that fire and like making you want to go to the shop the next day and open the fucking kill and you just can't wait to see and like hold this thing that you fucking made when you like, when you have that and that's like your daily routine, it's, it just like drives you to like just crush the next day and then the next day and the next day and and so it's and it makes it feel good the whole time and like that's what life is about it's feeling good so if we can figure out how to work and su support our families and ourselves and feel good at the same time fucking there's nothing more magical that's a great um you know independent artist mindset and i definitely want to get into how you apply that into becoming a brand name mothership but first, let's stick with the old stuff for one more second. Do you know what the oldest pieces are that are out there available right now? Your, uh, your oldest pieces that are currently available anywhere. And just to kind of lead that a little bit, I'm gonna shout out Steve from OPM Glass. That's Steve, my guy. Steve is a legend, he's in here somewhere with us. And he brought the vintage pieces that you see up here with all the um, different pattern work and you, you've all seen these for years and years it might have been the first piece you ever saw that led you to this spot right now so thank you Steve from OPM and uh, he's got an amazing shop so if you want to see the history of glass pipes in America from all the American makers Check out OPM Glass. Oh, he definitely has the best collection of of your work. Uh, of my of, and and a bunch of the, a lot of the OGs. You know, it's like uh, 
He's got, he's got it going on right there. He has everybody but scooping. good luck. Well, I'm, I'm just like, kind of good luck getting those ones. Yeah. Stuff. Hey. I was like, he said no so many times. <laughs> I was like, he's got this amazing store because he doesn't sell it. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's open for biz, and a lot of the pieces are on the market, so check them out. But is there work besides these two examples and the rest of the stuff in OPM that you know is out there still lingering in shops? Or has it all been snatched up? Uh, there's, there's, Explore Gallery has a lot of fire. Explore Gallery has yeah, some yeah. old pieces. I, you know, it's hard for me to know where. I, I don't know where it's at. It, it's been, I just make it. It's been maybe a, a little while since things were not released as Mothership, yeah? Yeah, it's been a, yeah, it's been, I mean, yeah, I, I got absorbed like uh, 10 years ago, really. It's uh. I, I just found that um, through a couple of these really big pieces that I, that I did in the past and how long they took, and then lo looking out into the future and being like, you know, like me and I even made this uh, Eye of the Flame piece, and it was just huge and shout out Flow Magazine. Oh right? yeah, that was, that was actually the first so piece I ever saw from you besides in a sesh one time. Yeah, and and the thing. It took us so long, and uh, you know, shout out to like uh, Timmy at, at Headventure because he like he helped enable it happen because it was taking so long. It was like a six month process that that piece got made, you know. And dude, I got a family, I got to feed them, you know. It, it was like so to get paid halfway through on this thing that we were making, you know, and him having the faith that it was gonna like come out and stuff was fucking really, really. Cool, you know, and there was definitely some shops in the beginning that Steve is definitely one of those, you know, that that enabled me to push the limits, you know, because if you don't have that, you have to pay those fucking bills, you know, <laughs> I need hats, and so it was. Uh, so you yeah. do you do the independent artist grind for a number of years, a long number of years before establishing Mothership Glass. One of the questions coming down the line from the internet is. Does a brand format limit the variety of styles and techniques you can use? You were mentioning the exploration as an independent artist using all those things. Uh, to this person, what would you say when they say, would it limit or is it actually putting all those techniques together? It's actually enabling a lot more, but it's, um, it's a slow process to grow into because as we as we become more and a bigger team and, and we all learn and we're all better glass blowers and it enables us to come together and make these new things. But you know, as you know, you're trying to form and get skills in people and stuff, you can't necessarily just throw them right to the hardest stuff to make. There has to be some progression. So you, you are limited on how fast that your team's progressing, you know. On, on what you can really make. And that's why I'm so, like, I'm just, ugh, it gives me goosebumps every time that I think about it now of just where we're at with the team and just like all the sorting of people and just, we are at this point where we can just, we're really about to be able to do anything that's in my head. And, and, and that was just a, that was like this point that we needed to get to and now we can start like imagining the new crazy awesomeness. It's yeah. it's it's it's, it's, it's so cool. it's so important having that that team that supports you around you like that too. Oh, it is. In all areas of what we do, we, we have so much. We got to have hats. We got to wear from shipping, receiving, social media, all that stuff. That's yeah. what I was gonna say. Like my, um, I'm just super fortunate that um, my family got really involved in my business, and like my my mom is head of uh, the HR department and. Literally, it was the biggest godsend when she came in because we, I don't know how to do any of this shit. And I'm fucking kind of an asshole. It, like, I'm not going to deal with too much stuff, and I don't, I don't really have that uh, enough patience for all that. And my mom is like the most patient, amazing, best listener. Just like everything, what what this whole team like needed so much to like really keep us together because it was about to go. 
for a second. There. That's awesome. And Shout my out moms, moms, all the moms. And my, my sister Katie. Katie, sister. thank you. Uh, she's so she's so amazing. She like took literally because I'm not a business guy, and and I just love blowing glass. And so we're like got this company and we're and I'm just not paying attention to anything, just, you know, just making glass and we're fucking. And so I literally not. There was this point that it came to where we're, we were not making money. We were actually like losing money. And um, some of the big pieces, because we'd like, you, I would make something and I'd you know, sell it for 50 or 100 grand. And then that would like, it would somewhat, it, it would like, so that money and all the money just got put together. And so then we're paying and everything. And then after a, like a while, we realized, okay, we're actually losing money. And these, there's these other pieces that are funding us even being able to work. And so it was um, through like her like hard work and her awesome brain that she made all these like crazy systems to where now we know exactly how much everything costs and how much we have into everything and what we have to sell it for in order to like make an actual profit and to have a company. and. We just like never had that before. We were just flying blind through space, and now we got like, you know, we got GPS and we got fucking maps and fucking. We know where we're going and we know how to get there. And it's like, oh, I just, and it's so so blessed, so blessed. So such a good team. Does that help you um, have a vision of where the industry is looking like it's going in the next three to five years? Now that you've been on the mothership path for as long as you know. Like, ask that again with, with the... <laughs> Here's the question. What do you envision the industry looking like in three to five years? You've seen where it came from. You know where it is now. Where do you think it's going? I mean, it's, it's, it's exactly like um, the technology spectrum, you know? It was like, okay, we're, we're slowly like getting this, we're getting on like some TVs and some radios and some like whatever, and then all of a sudden it's like, ah, all these computers and like crazy, like we can talk to anybody on the planet and see them on our phone and just like, be like it's, it's insane. And that is literally like the same trajectory that the glass is going right now. I just see it, you guys are all just fucking crushing it and we're all just like, being inspired off of each other and taking it to the next level, the next level, the next level. So it's it it is just about to go. So I gotta see we're gonna see more progression in the next three years than we've seen. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. We're constantly seeing makers who get ten years worth of knowledge and experience in two to four years time now. And it used to be about a 10 year standard to where you could get somebody leveled up to that point. Yeah. Uh, so shout out to all the young makers out there who are keeping yeah. us old fogies on our toes yep. yeah. and making us get into the new techs and try and flip it on you guys and turn it back over to where the inspiration goes back and forth and back and forth. It's never ending. And everything that anybody has been inspired by you by ends up taking them in a new direction, which goes right back to your point about exploring all those different techniques. That's where everybody's finding their own voice. And a lot of people here are gonna ask, how do I find my voice? My Not my one thing I make necessarily, but how do I find what I like to do? What's what's What am I doing that maybe didn't click like it did for you? You just jumped in, found, a bajillion techniques, were good at all of them, crushed it out, ended up taking this long pathway to get to the point where now you're exploring everything through mothership. So with everybody who's kind of just like doing their very first mushroom implosion, then where where does that leave them as far as finding a voice in today's very, very noisy atmosphere of pipe making? Yeah, it's that's a it's that's a hard one, but I, I honestly feel if you really slow down, for they're a not in the same world we are. They're all oversaturated by social media, online. Can't put the phone down. Can't stop paying attention to what everyone else is doing. We were all fortunate 
enough to be pre-internet where it ends up to where you are by yourself in a hole doing something and then you look at it when it comes up the next day and you go, I either did good or I did bad. And then maybe you were lucky enough to compare it to another person who was near you that was also making stuff. Or get contemporary lamp working, Bondu, what's up? And end up realizing that in your first couple of years, you are garbage. <laughs> and it makes it to where then you start looking at those things. Like we, we came up in books and magazines. Everybody now is going lightning speed. How do they even, are you saying detach, like throw your phone in the garbage? I, I mean, or just put I, it down and go for a walk in the woods. I, 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 you know, it's it's. I feel very, very, very fortunate to not have to um, do the social media thing. I have with like people that do that for me. Thanks, Lucas. <laughs> you know, and so. Um, that can be a big piece of advice. If you can if you have can, someone take over your social don't media, do it. if you have a don't photographer that. friend, don't, if you have, don't, you know, don't read it. Don't. accept the help that's around you. If there's people there to fulfill that position, it will get you right back on the torch and making more stuff, which is what you need to do as a maker. And every, if honestly, if all those hours that you're actually looking at this phone, you actually were on the torch blowing, you would be so much better. <laughs> you know, it's like it, 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 it really, you know. Practice makes better. Yeah, practice makes, but it's, uh, I would say, like, if they want to find their voice or like whatever, it's, uh, it's following your it's following your heart it's like it's like you have the ultimate radar inside of you and if you really like slow down enough and get in some place quiet and if I can take some time to yourself you'll you'll know what to do and you'll and you'll you'll yeah you'll feel it you know and yeah, it's like whispers you, in the wind and when you're when you're and make what feels good to you, you know? And like, and if you really do that, you're winning. You're winning, that's what, that's all we're trying to do here. And, and, and just don't get stuck on it, who cares what it is? If it actually feels good to you, fucking, you're fucking killing it. That's, that's the goal. That's As you're the, jumping through all the it. techniques in the early part of your exploration, did you end up honing in on those things where you were like, ooh, I want to spend the next month doing mushroom implosion penance, or I really, really need to do this pattern work. Like, once you did it for the first time, was there something that you got obsessed with? And that yeah, I mean, definitely the disc slips for, for, for years I was upset because it was, the, it was the only way to get, like, more um, of a message across, or more of a, you know, because you can, you can do the sculptural stuff too, but with, like, the patterning, and actually like drawing stuff, you know, okay, well, this has a Celtic feel to it. And so like without those patterns, it's not gonna have that, you know, and so. So you're inspired by Celtic patterns, but did you do that first? I don't know, I'm asking, because I don't I'm know, did anyone yeah. do a like disc flip style piece before you did it? Uh, um, I would say definitely yes. But in a different way. Um, yeah, in a different way. Um, uh, the the person that I saw doing it first was um, uh, Pedro Smiley, and he he would do like um, he, like he would have like three disc lifts and he would just put them together, you know, to make the whole entire thing, you know, more with like less of like the filler filler stuff. And so that was in you know. Not, you know, 99 or whatever was the was the first thing that I saw. He had like drew this like yin yang and then this other little spiral and then had a little reversal and had them all together in this section. And I was like, oh, that's that's tight. And I was like, oh, that's that's a cool technique to like drawing on the the one side and flipping it over. And so yeah, you just and took then, it and went yeah, that way the, with it. Yeah, so well, like we were talking earlier with the with the with the fillers and like doing that before you understood what sacred geometry was. And then you learn about sacred geometry and realize you've been living this kind of intuitively without actually, you know, subconsciously also. Yeah, yeah, no, it was like, I, when, I didn't know anything about sacred geometry when I first started blowing glass and it was naturally happening with the patterns, just like it does in nature. It's like everything. And so 
it's uh, it was just it was, I mean it's obviously that's what it's going to do because it's everything you know but yeah you know, but, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know and, but you know the, with the gravity and just spinning and the way and the heat then it naturally spins up and it like spirals you know and then you do it the other direction and you do the exact same thing on it and then all of a sudden you have depending on what pattern you put on there you have a a, a ratty and if you put the the lights just perfect and they're all they have the the right amount of crosses in them and stuff that it makes like this I'll, i like did this thing and then it was like a perfect seed of life and i was like what is that and because i had seen it in the this other pattern i was like oh that's crazy like that it made that exact pattern you know but was, somehow you did it <laughs> that's what i'm saying yeah. okay that's so what gets me keeping yeah. with the technical Incredible. part let's go into the colors so around this time Colors are not uh, known as the easiest to use. And yeah. I got a question also uh, sent in from the internet. What colors are your best recommendations to work with? Let's make that a two-parter. Like, back in the day, were you picking color choices based on knowing that you could work with them? Or were you specifically going for things that no one else was using? What was your direction with the color and color knowledge at that uh, early stage? It was it was whatever looked the prettiest to me, you know, and so... And you didn't care whether it was going to work or not? I, I didn't care if you it was... You needed that I, green... I, and, and, I, and I just wanted to see, and I wanted to see what, you know, it, and some of the some of the colors you definitely couldn't use, you know, and but a lot of them, what I, what I discovered is that, you know, it was just because there was air in them was the problem, you know, like all the first crayons and everything, it's just like so much air that you just hit a flame on it and it bubbles up and one time I was like I was heating up um, a rod and it did and it didn't bubble up like right on the end I was like wow I was like and then I'm like pulling some more string and it's just all bubbly and nasty and then like the next day I like was going to pull some more stringers and I started to pull the stringers and it didn't bubble up and I was like oh and I was like oh it's because it's the first thing that I pulled off and the the end of the rod was was clipped, you know, so it was like cut, and and as soon as you melt that, then it the because there's air bubbles all the way down it, then it's just bubbly every time you like try to heat it up right there, all these bubbles come up. But if you clip it and it's open, and you put the flame a little bit back there, you can push the air out and you get this one little piece of like. So it doesn't matter what color or how much air there is in it, you can get this little ball of jemmy fucking juiciness and then so you pull that into the stringer then you clip off the front of the thing and then you do the same thing again so you you know you waste like half the color by doing it you know and you have all but these little chunks but you get the juicy with no juice. air and then you can yeah. like draw these patterns with it or you can like um like the the take me to the mothership with the um with the pot plant and the aliens and stuff that piece the rainbow like all the balls on it and everything that was that was as big of a section that i could make clean clean you know because <laughs> it was like you could only like melt the last of, you know like maybe three quarters of an inch of the rod on the end and make it good you know and so and then i'd ball that up and i'd stripe a little bit of clear on it blow it into a ball and then i like built that little tree thing with that but it was like yeah, it's just trying to figure out the how to yeah. do it clean. You this know? is my favorite part of the interview because you're seeing him relive that moment, and each of us has had all those little moments where you're like, "Yes, I understand." In a way that I didn't understand before yeah. this moment, and now I can never go back. So that was really cool. And was that the <laughs> remember taking to the lunch? That was that before you started doing like the rainbow chains and working more on like the academy and rainbow colors. That was yeah, it was right at the time. Yeah, that was that that was like oh, I can do, I can, you can work these things. Yeah. It's like really hard, but you can't have the giant sections of them, but you can you can make little juicy sections. Do you and, do you have a guesstimate on that um, on that piece that you're talking about with the rainbow colors? How long it took you? Was it months? Was it a year? Was it just? It was, I, I, off and on? Yeah, it was, it, was, it, was, it was, no, it was off and on for like six months. So those mega pieces, you would work them in that way while you're making spoons and oneies and whatever else on the side because yeah, you, you, have, gotta yeah, yeah, you gotta pay you gotta, you, gotta, you, gotta pay, you gotta pay some bills, yeah. so I was lucky, you know, to be, to be making, you know, because I, I, 
I never really made, I never made anything that wasn't going to be improving my skills. So if I'm going to make like a, a little spoon pipe or something, you know, I was like doing those carved dragons or I was doing like, uh, I was doing something that was more than just the, like the frit pipe and trying to get that quick dollar. I wanted some skills with that quick dollar. <laughs> right, uh, paid to practice is what yeah, I like to call it. Okay. Um, uh, do you have any other years long pieces in the pipeline? Anything right now that you got that sit and chilling that you worked on for a couple months and stopped and put yeah, aside? Definitely way too many things. But <laughs> I, I, you know, I got some, I, I got a couple real epic heaters that that it's funny because the ideas with and it's because they're uh, they're collabs yeah. too and so extra pressure extra pressure and then so and as i evolve then i just want to because i want to do the thing that feels good to me so if i don't execute it right away it's not it's not new, it's not fresh enough. Even if I've had the idea for so long, yeah. it was like, even it's if I didn't do it, I'm like, oh, but I got way better ideas now, you yeah. know? And so I'm like, so it's just funny that, yeah, so like this, this. Uh, Have you heard about um, McElroy's uh, collab Forgiveness Day? <laughs> no. It's Chris McElroy, Two Stroke. He started Collab Forgiveness Day, and you might not be aware of it, but you're all invited to engage in it. Collab Forgiveness Day is real, and it means that if you have work that's been sitting on your bench of someone else's for over a certain amount of time, and you feel a certain type of way about it, you can send it back to them on Collab Forgiveness Day, and they will forgive you because you didn't do your fucking job. And here's the deal, you forgive them, and it, it could yield you pieces coming back to you too. We've all left work with other people that didn't get finished, and it's something that glass blowers need to accept, and I gotta tell you, if you send that work back, oh, all the weight is off your chest. And then they get their, their prep back, the sickest prep they've ever made comes back to them like years later and they, they collab with themselves and they, they, they make like the best piece they've ever made in their career. So anyway, shout out to Chris. Uh, he, he started that concept. I have been trying to push it ever since. I think he said maybe it was October 8th, but I changed the rule to any day of the year. If you see it and it's, and it's making you feel weird, just do that. Well, yeah, I love you. I'm sorry. It's basically <laughs> like I fucked so up. Hard. I well, need it, to, it keeps you from doing things. It it does. And if yeah. you're that type of artist, not all of us have that type of mindset, but a lot of us do. Probably Maybe more so. so than not, where that type of weight on your mind makes you feel weird, and then it it, it makes the piece not approachable, and it makes it to where if you do do something and you fuck it up, you feel a billion times worse because you waited forever to do it. So and, and how do you do a, another collab with, and like there's all these collabs that I know would have happened in the last couple of years, but I have these couple on my plate that I can't like, like let those guys even see me like do putting a bunch something. of work into something else without like doing Agreed. that, you know? It, it, so it, so it ends up being about your personal integrity and how you are working through your process as a maker. Basically, it's okay to say no. Uh, yes, that is that. Fuck yeah! I, I learned that was a long time ago, and my main uh, advice for collabing is collab in person, collab together, fuck mailbox collabs unless they're absolutely necessary. Because collabing in person is when two forces come together to make a piece that otherwise the one alone could not make. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. What's next? Beautiful. I don't know. What's how we got time? Uh, we're 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 doing good. So, do you collect pipes? I I do. I, I I have a I have a decent collection. Do you have out of your collection? Do you have a most treasured piece, or maybe is it the, your first pipe that you just got back? Uh, yeah. Oh, you brought that. <laughs> <laughs> you brought that. I did. I did. Here, we should pass it around just so you guys can get some. So, do you have a most treasured piece out of your pipe collection? I do have, um, I, I have, I have two that I'm really attached to, and it, this one right here is my, is my most, uh, me and Junichi, uh, when the, the Grateful Dead were doing their last show, 
um, at Soldier Field and fucking all my friends and all of us were trying to get tickets and shit and literally none of us got fucking tickets. It was like, we were like, how does this even fucking happen? And then uh, um, one of my guys, Jeff, um, their friend worked at Soldier Field and when they have boxes available, you know, and the people that own the box don't, um, aren't going to the show, then they offer to the employees first. And so, so they like call me up and they're like, well, you gotta buy all 35 of these tickets if you if you want. And so we get you got like the sick is that soldier field like right like looking direct down to this wow. this box and and 35 fucking tickets. So now I got 35 people to invite and it was like in Junichi. Um, I just know how much like how much I uh, he loves the Grateful Dead and stuff and so. And I, I, it's like what you know got me into this and my passion too. And so I was like, oh, I'm gonna invite him. And so I invited him over to go to these shows. And it's cool because he doesn't speak any. He doesn't speak English. So. You guys all know he's talking about Rose Rhodes. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Rose Rhodes. And uh, so we just had the most magical experience and trip you know like going out there to Chicago and uh, going to these shows and like we just blew he had he actually had never seen the Grateful Dead before so it was like uh, it was this and um, we 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 de virginized him for sure and all sorts of ways <laughs> but it was like just such a cool trip and experience and and we made this piece when he came out and so it was just like the one that I just I, there's just some things that money can't buy, you know, and, and yeah, there's absolutely. too many memories and too many like awesome things that it just makes me feel and like remember it. So that's my that's that's my most favorite one. And then um, I have this Jenkins piece that's fucking so sick with like these skeletons in the middle of this little scene, and he's got these bud plants growing up, and he's like smelling the nugs, and it's like. Uh, Fucking insane. I love that kid. Do you find this collab like having that language barrier there? Like you guys are able to really talk with glass as like your language? Oh yeah, the, uh, definitely, definitely. It's when you're on that same page, you yeah. can like. It's uh, very powerful stuff. Yeah, it really was. It was. It was. It was. It was so cool to have him out here for that, for itself. a couple of weeks. So. Yeah. Hell yeah. So for myself, like I, you know, I hear the word master thrown around a lot. You know, a lot of artists, whether they've been blowing glass for a style, or whatever, for 80, 100 years, you know, whatever, they hear the word master and it's like, I'm not a master, you know, type of thing. For yourself, Later. exactly. <laughs> Are we all? <laughs> for yourself, the word, the term, you know, master is, is you know, is thrown around. And, and when Mothership came to be uh, an entity of, of what it is. You know, you hit this pinnacle in your in your career as a solo artist, and in in quote unquote as a master, right? You're, like, you're kind of bored with maybe these techniques because you're kind of finding new places to go. There's to no mastering you. this shit. He's he's trying trying there is no mastering this shit. It like that's, that's it keeps me it keeps me on my toes. Exactly. And, like I'm discovering like the new things all the time. Like so excited about all these new things that I want to do that I've never seen done or I've never done but before. But you find like the mothership. The whole creation that, as you are now, has allowed you to continue to oh. hit the pinnacle. To hit the pinnacle. Oh yes, it's like you cannot hit the pinnacle by yourself. Like uh, it's when I just I knew that I had visions that were way, way bigger than myself, you know, and that there's no way I can <coughs> do this alone. And and and. It's so much funner with the team. It's so much more enjoyable, you know. And so, uh, but you just you can't. You need a team, and and what the team enables to do, it's by crazy tools and different things, you know, like like the laser that enabled me to come up with that new hologram technique and stuff, and like like. You just like an artist by yourself. You can't like just go out and spend seventy grand on this thing that you might be able to do something with. You know, yeah, it was yeah. like we needed packaging and we needed these other things, and maybe we could use it for glass. But it made it that we could that we could purchase that. And if I didn't have fucking forty people working there and us like needing something like that, it just wouldn't have happened. You know. So as the individual artist, it's really hard to like 
really just take it to these next levels. And so, but as soon as you have so many people and so many working parts and you're so big, it's really, it actually makes sense to buy that or to like go down that road or whatever. So it really has, it just keeps, I mean, Scott Deppie kind of just got absorbed by mothership. And I mean, like, you know, 10 years ago and I had, and I've just been putting every, every drop of sweat and blood fucking into that, you know, and it's, it's so much more than I could ever be by myself, you know, and so. Yeah, and I think it shows with the way that it, the company has grown to this high end, like high end echelon of what you know, it is to be a glassmaker. maker. I personally saw Mothership skyrocket to the upper echelon that it has held since, and I am, you know, just a humble observer, but it's wild to see fellow pipe makers, glass blowers, do anything that gets that type of momentum to where I feel like I blinked and then Mothership was yeah, everywhere. Cross circles. Crazy for it. And so it, it was really wild to see that going from meeting you early on and then you know, I'm tied up in my own world, and a few seconds later, your mothership, and you're dominating the functional bong market, and I'm like, holy cannoli, this yeah. is this is something that not a lot of pipe makers I know could do, and I didn't even know the specifics of who is involved, who's behind the scenes, all the stuff. I'm just watching like everybody else here from a distance, and being like, what is going on? And the whole world's waking up, and you see technology, social media, all pick it up and run yeah. hard with it. And then it makes it to where here we are now talking about your tra transition from an uh, independent maker to a full on powerhouse brand, like one of the most recognized names. And now I'm guessing internationally, I know it's definitely national, but you're probably internationally around the world as one of the high end labels. So what do you do knowing that that's where you are at right now it was a whirlwind to get there but now you're in this whole new arena right what's the next moves as mothership while still being you within the company and innovating guiding the designs and the like techniques that you guys want to uh, put into the work but then knowing that you have a business to run that you have employees that are counting on you and a payroll and all that stuff. <laughs> or, or some question, do you, do you get to go into your lab and someone else is handling that? You have a manager, do you have you know all these different things? People are curious because you guys are a big brand and it still seems like it is a small studio vibe because all the pieces are so intricately worked but you're still putting out enough to where shops are getting drops uh, work is showing up all around social media how is it that that leaves you to either continue making and keep your blinders on and just go or do you actually jump in and have to make those big decisions as the company owner founder um. Both. I'm mean, like, it's it's both. It's becoming less and less all the time that I need to be involved in some things. You know, it's like my my team is amazing. You know, it's like, uh, yeah. If I yeah, I, I pretty much can do whatever right now. We're at this point, and, and it, 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 we're in this transition point where we're going to start actually moving into, we're going to do less series and more into each series, series and like have an actual, like, some big semi-masterpiece with each series, you know, that we're going in on, and then um, you know, like the standard um, designs that we have with, uh, you know, the artwork that is for that series, but then doing whatever the theme is, doing sculptural aspects of all those pieces too. So then, so it'll just be this more, this, uh, it'll, 
it'll just have a lot more bigger ultra headies in in each series instead of just more of the standard pieces like we've been doing now. Was this the plan from day one? Was this yeah, your yeah, roadmap, yeah, yeah, yeah. or is it this was, like a new iteration? Yeah, no, of this, is, this is. No, it's. It, I mean, from day one, it was like, okay, I want to be able to like make you know the take me to the mothership piece or like that piece with Ivan and us just pumping those out all the time, and that's all, that, I mean, that's all we really want to do, but it's one thing, if one of those goes wrong, and you have all of that, then you're kind of, and you got 40 people to pay, it kind of can be pretty disastrous. So to have things that are more streamlined, that you know the percentage that, okay, this is definitely 80, 90% chance that it's gonna turn out, then you can, um, you'll be okay. And so you gotta have some of those things, and then the more of those things that you have, and the better you're doing, the further that you can go out on the other limb and try these new things that are experimental and might not end up working out. How much of your time in the shop do you devote to new techniques, unexplored territory, and something that isn't already in the lineup, so that you're pushing that next phase, that new, design element? Um, I'm trying to do that pretty much all the time right, <laughs> right now, you know, yeah. if I, it, I have to, you have to do some things and you get in the middle of, of, of some things and so it doesn't feel like you're doing that, but you, but you really kind of are, you haven't really got it all mastered. It's what it feels like sometimes to me that I'm like, okay, I should be on to something else, but I'm like, no, no, we got to really fully dial things in before, um, a lot of times before they're handed off to the team because if you don't then, I mean we've just, we've learned it in the past that like sometimes uh, I'll, I'll do things and I'll make something and then we'll have some people be making it and not be paying attention. And that's what's so cool about um, my sister's systems that she has made. Now we know if we're actually making money off of that but there, there's literally some different things that we we made for over a year and we were losing like every time we sold one we were losing five hundred dollars when we sold it for uh wholesale or, or i meant retail you know so then when we were selling it for wholesale it was like even yeah. worse and like for over a year it just like i mean a couple hundred grand and just like absorbed into it without paying attention so really but you don't know until you know yeah and exactly. it, it Barely any of us uh, took business classes and stuff, so like, you know, it, it comes down to uh, again getting the help from the help that's available and anybody who's got expertise in those other areas, like, use their knowledge to uh, help you progress forward. We're we're at the point where we're going to open up to some Q and A from the audience. If you guys have a question, just throw your hand up. I'm going to walk to you and. We'll, uh, we'll do some live Q&A if anybody has any extra follow-up stuff to what we're talking about or something completely off the dome. One sec. Here you go. Uh, thanks so much, Scott. I just wanted to ask if you could buy a pipe from a contemporary pipe-making artist that's alive, who would you... Who would you spend your money on? Yeah. Who would you spend your hard-earned money on nowadays? Um, Jenkins. You already answered it. I already did. I, 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 that piece I just bought a couple of years ago. So that, that would be, uh, honestly, yeah, it would be Jenkins right now. Very cool. But there's, a, there's a bunch of others, too, but that was... He, Go ahead. He really does. It's on. WJC. Nice. I just wanted to say thank you. And prior to Glass, what was your first like? What was your first inspiration like? An artist that was a young child or something that just wowed you in the art world. Um. It Do you remember a piece or an artist in particular that you saw and you were like, I need to know that name or understand what that is? You know, I, I really, I, I don't remember. Music. I mean, yeah, definitely music, I would say. That was my, that was the art that I was, that I was really into, you know? Yeah. I was, uh, 
Yeah. Do you think growing up in the more in the Mormon family, the church wise, like that kept you from being exposed to oh, arts? So sheltered. Yeah. So so sheltered. Yeah. It, it was. Yeah. That religion doesn't really want you to like feel lots from outside things, you know. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah. Okay. All right. Here's another one. Uh, I just wanted to ask, what skill do you think helped you build the most skills from it? You were saying you wanted to always do something that you felt was making you better, and I was wondering what technique or what like ideas helped you the most to get better? And also, do you use China football? <laughs> uh, Did you hear him for the first part? What skills, when you were exploring all this, the techniques, which one of those was the one that helped you really get better and was the built the thing you built on? Um, so there's these uh, there's these like implosion marbles that um, that the guy uh, Jeremiah Newman that got me into it that he would do and it was like this it was an open ended tube so you'd have to you'd have to rip the tube apart and then and and you want it totally like you cut it on the saw. That would be the, the best. So you're having to rip a piece of you know 30 mil tubing and make a perfect lip on it, you know. And then you would you would decorate that with dots around the lip of it, and then down about an inch down the thing. So you could do dots, or you could do like some little squigglies or whatever. So it gave you you had to like pull some little stringers out. You were like putting these dots on and stuff. And then, then you would implode it, and depending on how you would hold it, it would you would get different effects, and the lines would totally suck up into it, and it, because it would start out open, and then as you would melt it, it would close, and it would all seal up, and then you could get it to really suck up in there, and the lines be up in there, and then you could actually pull it into a little milli and, and slice it up, you know, or you could have this more like marble, or you could have it be a little bit flatter and just be more like a pendant. So there was like all these different um, things that you could kind of do with it. And there was just, and then you had to get it off of the tube. So you had to punny up to the back of it and you had to rip off the, the, the whole front of it and then even that out. And just all of those, there, there's so many different things that you have to do in like that one thing. And so that was literally, like, uh, I mean, then that's why that pipe turned out that nice, is that I had made probably 20 of those marbles before I made that pipe, you know? And so um, that was one of the, the things that I did the most that it was just, it like touched on everything a little bit. Has know? everybody gotten to see the pipe? Awesome, let's uh, have that wave make its way back up to the front when you guys are done. <laughs> And, um, and I do, and I do use China cobalt. Not only China cobalt, I use all. I use I use the best glass that there is available, and um, glass isn't a race thing, you know. And so it's um, porous silicate, or it's not. Yeah, it's thirty three C. And so, and so the the a, a bunch of the problem with a bunch of the china is that it gets hella beat up. So it's just. It's ruined on the outside, so if you put it in the flame, it just gets tired and it just like bubbles up and does all these things and, and different things. But for the actual like glass and the quality of it, I'm just saying like not one American company has anything on some of those colors that they're doing. They're like totally air free and like like nice sizing and like different things. And so it's just like we use the best glass in the world, whatever that is, you know. And and sometimes it's an American company, sometimes it's a Tesla blocking company, sometimes it's a China company, you know. So yeah. it's uh, it's yeah. We got got to try them all, yeah. you know. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and and they and they definitely weren't uh, that super evolved. Like the the, I mean, literally, I didn't use it for so long because you couldn't because. There was it definitely like when they first started making it. I mean, it was just like the American guys. The shit twenty years ago fucking sucked from everybody. You know, so <laughs> okay. it was just like. And I mean, it's it's like I love all the color companies, but the 
they're still, it's not ultra consistent. You know, you get a batch of some amazing stuff and then like the next batch that you get, you order the same thing and it either has error in it or it's like doing a different striking thing or it's doing like, it's just not consistent. So, you know, so. So they do have some consistency in those cobalt tubes. They and do. If you, you know, if you've ever worked it, I don't know why you wouldn't work any glass that is available to you. It, yeah, I'm coming from the, uh, uh, the perspective of being heavily aligned with Glass Alchemy and loving all the American companies that led the way, but have acknowledged what's been going on worldwide the entire time we've been makers. So if you're not trying all that stuff to see what they have going on, then Try it all. You're, you're missing out. Uh, any other questions? All right. Hey, Scott, thanks so much for your time. <clears throat> I just wanted to, to ask you specifically about the issues that you were having with your physical ailments when you were having issues with your wrists and your shoulders. You said that you, you healed your mind, and that's kind of what led to the pain and everything else diminishing. How did you heal your mind, or what do you recommend to heal your mind? Um, taking some, I mean, taking some time, going in the dark room, being by yourself and meditating and fucking going inside and like really really um, rehearsing how you want your life to be and what you want to happen in it and harnessing the emotions of what that would be if that actually was your reality and trying to live the reality that you want to live before it's it's evidence there and like actually feel it in your heart you have to feel it and you have to fucking know that and just feel like it's already happened and then you get up and you fucking walk into your day like that like it's fucking already happened and it will and it's just like we are the ultimate creators and the the power is inside of us to literally like do anything that you want, and and it's that's that's all it is. It's intention, it, intention with feeling produces this. That's what it's what this is, you know. So mm -hmm. that's powerful. Are you meditating daily? Definitely, definitely. I yeah, I I get up every morning like hella early, and I give myself a couple hours to uh to be with myself and to like and i i i want i don't want to get up from my meditation until i feel like something's changed like i'm different you know and 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 once i feel different then fucking yeah that's one ritual man it's watch so out. important you know so important it's, uh, i saw some other hands shoot them up If you start your day like that, you're pretty invincible. You know, you get your head on straight, you get your heart and your fucking head being coherent, and like, like anything can come at you, and you'd just be so much better for everyone you run across that day. You know. Go ahead. Dude, so you figure out a new technique. How do you pass it to your friends? How do you get your whole shop on the same level? Uh. I mean, practice, I mean, it's like, uh, it's, and it, I mean, it's hard to get everybody on the same, on the same level because they have to want to, one, so it's hard to, we're you're not just going to get everybody on the same level, so a lot of times, um, if we're doing something new, um, it's the people that, uh, that you see the interest and they're like trying and they're like asking questions and stuff, and then, and then it's just about like, the one on one and like trying and going through things and and then it's a lot of asking questions, you know, that like and, and so it's it's a lot up to them really, you know. And then I just kind of whoever because the whole thing is that I just wanted to feel good to them what they're doing, you know, and so if they're wanting and they're interested in doing it, that's what I know that that feels good, you know. So those are the people that I want to like 
bring into the new technique or the new piece or the new like whatever that we're doing. Can you read people like that when you see them naturally being drawn to the wanting to learn that next thing and stuff? Oh yeah, no, you can. I mean, you, some people can. I'm saying, you, can you? Oh yeah, I, I mean, I definitely. So you pick and up on will, that. And you can see it in like like just okay are they in there at like when they're not working and are they let you know like they're not on the clock and they're like trying to figure something out they just won't like want something for themselves and they're like dedicated yeah it is. i mean we, we yeah <coughs> uh, who else Matic. what's the story behind the deputy's darkness color oh the 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 Deppie's Darkness was, uh, we were doing the International, International Hot Final. Glass yeah. Invitational <laughs> at South Point. Yeah, yeah, Shout yeah. out to Glasscraft and Beat Expo. Yeah, that was awesome. That was insanity. Yeah, that was 2009. Was so and cool. yeah, there was a group of people there. You guys were doing furnace borosilicate in public. Yeah, the first, yeah, it was like, uh, like a lot of people have furnaces now and we're make, making our tube and pulling it out and doing different things, but like that was not uh, a real thing. And, and A was like, uh, so they asked me to form a team. And so I like, you know, I, of course. Who's on the team? Of course, I'm calling Banjo and Darby and Clinton. <laughs> yeah, and so it was like, uh, yeah. So you guys heard of them? Banjo, Darby, Clinton? <laughs> heard of those guys? They had a good team. and. Uh, and Abe was like, "You guys should, you guys should be Team North Star, and I'll sponsor you." You know, and I was, and I was like, "All right." I was like, uh, "I was like, if you get us hot furnaces there to where we can be pulling hot glass out of it, we'll do it." You know, and so he's like, "All right." And then so we met up down at um, North Star, all of us, and for a couple sessions to like decide what we were gonna make and pull some shit out of the furnace and like figure out because we were like, all right, if we're doing a flame off, if we have hot fucking molten glass, we're gonna have a, a leg up on everybody, right? It's like ready to go, you know? So we, uh, yeah, so we designed this uh, cool chandelier that we ended up like making with the furnace there in the, in the. I was one of the competing, yeah, it was, uh, it was on one of the competing teams and we got destroyed. <laughs> <laughs> we, did, every, we had a little advantage. Every, everybody, <laughs> if you were there, everybody was freaking out and barely any of the other pieces got looked at because their piece was so insane. It was huge. The color was striking because of just them flame working it because it is. The darkness, but it was, uh, it was yellow. Over, uh, over or mixed with. Is it the amethyst? Yeah, amethyst. Yeah, so, yeah. so that was originally like the the Debbie's darkness was, uh, I mean that it was Abe's trying to make some money on the entire like whatever, whatever the thing. Right, because <laughs> at the at the event it was it had no name. It, it had no name. It was just before. Yeah. yeah it was How did you guys choose amethyst with yellow? And was it both in the same pot? Um, we. It was there, but not originally, you know, when we first, when the, the actual, the really juicy one is when you dip them over, the yellow over the... Uh, right, that's what it became, the other right? one. Yeah, because when you mix them, it's, it just starts being so much like so many other, like striking well, dark colors. Yeah, you know? but that piece, at that time, to have that amethyst no, pushing was, all those ghosty blues, you know what you were yeah, doing. Yeah. All good. right, who else has a question? <laughs> <It was good. laughs> All those fumy blues. We were like, "What is this?" Outside of uh, blowing glass, would you say there's anything that has helped expand your skill set, uh, glass-wise? Besides meditation, I mean, definitely the meditation has helps. Um, Do you have any hobbies? I mean, I, I mean, I think just doing all. The, just any of the hand-eye coordination type things, you know, like, I, I, I really like, you know, I really like darts and pool and golf and, um, you know, I'm, I'm pretty, I'm very natural at all of those things came super easy to me, to be, to be fair.
fairly good at. And so I think uh, just doing a lot of that hand-eye coordination type uh, stuff has paid off. So if you're a good bowler, you can make some good bowls. Yeah. There you go. Or video games. I mean, you sit around playing games all day. Yeah. You're not making glass, but you know. Are you a gamer? No, I am not a gamer. I, okay. I, I, I've seen too many. I'm like, man, you would be a better glass blower than me if you actually didn't play video games <laughs> and you just spent that time like blowing glass. There's like so there's so many. And there's some really good glass blowers out there that would be literally the, twice as good if they didn't have any video games in their life because they would have got, you know, 10 years of work instead of only five years of work over the last 15, you know? Oh, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. What's up, Scott? So, uh, I was just wondering, uh, one of my favorite things like to see in glass is like a nice encased opal. And I noticed that, like, on, or, or most of your recent pieces, they don't. And is that a preference thing, or does that have to do with some type of compatibility, like making your glass last longer? Um, no, uh... You mean using opals? Yeah. He wants to know if you uh, are not using opals for any specific reason. No, no, I'm not, I'm, I'm not afraid of the opals. You just gotta, you gotta... Even, there's a way that you want to do it, and you want to make sure you have enough even glass ar around it. But I think that the uh, the beauty factor versus the risk factor is totally like worth it in in that you know. So but yeah. I don't. I try not to use uh, ones that have sharp edges on them. So I like the spheres if I'm going to because I just think that they're like way less likely to. Blow up. And then use them where they apply. Yeah, exactly. Don't, don't use them where where they apply. Works properly. Question. And we just did a bunch of pieces. You know, we had that. We did like quite a few open ones in 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 this little time. And so just uh, switch it up. We'll definitely. There's definitely some more open ones coming out eventually. But you know, keep switching it up. So, um, if you never discovered glass art, where do you think you would be right now? And also, what's your personal favorite glass color? I would be Smoke in prison. Be. <laughs> I would probably be in prison, or I would be like having one of the. I would be one of the top uh, like weed grower people right now. Having, uh, either weed business or be in prison. <laughs> uh, and what was that? Other question? What's your personal favorite glass color? If you could choose just one. It's so hard. So hard. There's, and and it's, about, it's so uh, hard because, you know, like, what's there, your there's favorite? a newness factor that it's hard to calculate okay, into the let's equation. Let's make it easier. You know? What's like, your favorite color from 1999? <laughs> <laughs> wow. You got it, you got it. I mean, it would be those green dwarf sticks, for oh, sure. Oh, dwarf green oh, fucking green dwarf sticks and the white dwarf sticks. Extinct corning <laughs> dwarf. Perfect answer. Next question. Throw your hands up, whoever. There you go. But the Illuminati is, I fucking, I just love it. It's just such a nice, the green's one of my favorites, and it's just a cool color of green, and it fucking glows and stuff. But some of those, like, uh, Boro Slugger bars, like like some of the new ones that, uh, it's just some of those purpley pinks and carmeline type, like some of those are just so, and I don't know if it's just because it's new, but it's, they're fucking pretty. <laughs> they're really pretty. Go ahead. Hey Scott, uh, thanks for doing all this, answering our questions and all that. I've got a couple. Uh, you might have gone over about the, the disc flips and the stringer work. Who is the person who taught you to do that type of intricate disc flip stringer work? Because it seems to me like you just kind of popped onto the scene. And yeah, no, there, crazy, was, there was, there was, shit. there was just, yeah, that was just me. Yeah. That was just me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that was. I mean, like I said, I saw uh, Pedro had this piece, and he had a. You know, he had a, a yin yang on there, and it was all like on the inside, and I was like, how the, you know, because I'd seen some of, um, you know, uh, the Snodgrass crew and stuff. They'd be Badger would be doing like his little, his little drawing things like that. But it was like, it was just so much cooler when it was the 3D, and it was like, like on the inside, and it was popping up, you know. And so, 
uh, yeah, so it was, it was really just, yeah, it was me just seeing that there was so much potential there and that, oh, you can actually just do anything. <laughs> I'm got. also curious about uh, the story with Draconis color. Do you know anything about that? And what's the, what's the history of that? Because it seems like this elusive color that I don't know the origin to. I'll tell them. Draconis came out of nowhere. It was in the late 90s, early 2000s. Draconis was made uh, by an independent color maker who somehow figured out how to bring satins out in a number of colors. Then it was um, absorbed by North Star. It might have actually been absorbed by Precision, which was Abe before he joined North Star. Then it ended up where uh, Draconis was owned by North Star and I think was worked into maybe a couple experimental things, but it ended up to where Draconis kind of just dissolved in and is now, you know, what it is, it's out there. They're satiny colors that you can get your hands on, yeah, but it was now, so nice. it, it was amazing for the time, but in, in the most recent time, we've seen a number of makers try and return to satin glass. Yeah. So it, it's not something that was lost forever because I've seen pieces that I didn't even know colors that are out right now that have that effect. And it's very, very similar to the draconis that we might have in our stash. Okay. Anybody else have a question out in the audience? Yeah? I was curious about these pieces here um, on the left, this bubbler and uh, this bong over here. This, this, uh, this was my very first bong that I ever made. Yep. Which is tight because it, it came back like magic too. It was like, yeah, it, was, it was out there and I got that one back. Uh, it was it was crazy because I got it back right like within all in the same year as that first piece. So it was yeah, it was it was cool. What year was that? Uh, two thousand. Nice. Two thousand seven to two thousand eight. I think they got started. Yeah, same, white. For, same for this one. Uh, white. Um, Trying to remember. Oh, it was uh, it was some big bars from a. So I think it was probably fat. So uh, star, star white. Yeah, that's what I think it was some old star white. Nice. Any other questions? Last chance. All right, I'm gonna grab these couple in the back. Oh, we got okay. One, two, three. Last <laughs> this was, questions. This was uh, this was from the last class that I taught. This was like the piece that I made in it from. Cause I kind of. Uh, just when I was, you know, I think it was 2010 or nine or something, and then just because I was starting the mothership thing, and and just as a teacher, I can't hold anything back, and I need to like fully let like people know everything, you know, and and when you when I'm like trying to come up with new things and new pieces and new things to like form this company and then we're going to be making the same thing over and over again I was like I don't know if it's the time to be teaching classes cuz I'm going to be how I'm going to teach this stuff cuz people are going to ask and then I'm not going to be a good teacher you know so I was just like all right I'm not I'm not going to do classes for a hot minute which I haven't done any classes since but we are, it is, it is a goal though, like, uh, I feel like at some point I will feel secure in the whole, everything that's going on with the mothership and everything that we can open it into kind of a semi-school and start doing some classes and different things like that, so that's eventually the, the goal. Go ahead. I was going to ask, obviously, Collabs are out of the question. This is not a collab question, but on solo work, where it's whether from mothership or whether it be a client or a fault, something like that. If a piece is cracking and you don't know why it cracked, first of all, does that at your level happen? And second of all, just walk me through. Like, do you feel frustration, or are you at the point where you're so far into it that are you feeling surprised? Just what was your emotion there with a cracked piece? That it's not a collab, just like more simple piece. While you're well, well, while you're working, while it's on the lathe, it's all cracked. What it it. it that it, it only cracks for one reason it's not hot enough <laughs> you let it get too cold and that's why it cracked and so it's literally impossible to crack something 
if it's hot, it just it does not happen. And so that's what I try to explain to my guys too. Sometimes they try to be like, yeah, I did, I was I doing this and I, I just cracked. I'm like, yeah, what's up, hot? Like, no, it was hot, it was hot. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure no, it was hot. hot. It was hot enough. Hot glass doesn't crack. And so, so invest in a Bunsen burner. Yeah, Bunsen burner. Um, you know, uh, there, there's all like, uh, I got all the guys laser guns that read the temperature now, so they can like, before they put the flame back on it, they think that it's hot, they can check it and make sure it's hot before they go back into it, you know, and so. It's really just user error if anything ever cracks, you know? It's just not being present and not really paying attention to what's going on. So it's not frustration, it's like you know why it cracks. Oh yeah, I, I always know why Nobody it likes to lose a piece. Yeah, it's a little bit frustrating, but it's better just to keep making and move on. Here's the next, quick next question. How's it going, Scott? First off, thank you so much for this. Um, I guess my question would be something that I guess I've noticed as far as you know, the Las Vegas community and things like just the classical community in general is events like this are so important for, um, I guess, the general scene. But having local representation, I think, is something that's very, very important. And I see that, you know, destigmatizing a lot of things with mothership and, you know, really pushing the agenda. So from some of the, I guess, like a younger cat's perspective, what would you recommend as far as trying to build community? And like, what is, I guess, like a call to action that you would like to see, things you've seen in the past, or things you'd like to see in the future moving forward, I guess? Did you catch all that? Yeah, I think so. Um, I mean, yeah, I, guess, I mean, it, 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 so you're talking about building uh, more community locally, is that? Like, Within his own local community, what's a great you know suggestion to help I, do I, that? I mean, honestly, um, you know, some of the um, different cats across the country that where they have a little bit of a scene, like doing something as a group, you know, like planning um, planning some type of charity type event to where you're doing something cool for the community and you're getting all the glass blowers in there together and people are meeting each other that. Didn't even know. Like, oh, that guy lives across town, or like, like whatever. You know, it starts opening these things up, and then you're getting together and you're doing something cool for the community. So then it's bringing the whole community in there too, and good, putting the glass floors and our scene in a good light and stuff. So I think like yeah, like charity, like uh, group collab event type things, and like that type of stuff, and have little fun parties. You know, I think that's the. That's the way to do it. All right, we have one more back here. Z. Yeah. Hey, how's it going? What's one thing that you would recommend to a current glass artist in order to improve their work? Um, that's, I'm going to go back to the uh, make what's feeling good to you, you know, and don't lie to yourself about it, you know, and and. It, if it's if it's feeling good, I just really think that the heart doesn't lie and that it, you're you're on the right path, you know. So I say I say that and 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 to try new things, you know. It's like uh, at least for me, it's the thing that I haven't done yet that is the most enjoyable for me. Do you keep a sketchbook like for ideas and concepts and things that you've had over the years? No, I, I like, I, I'm like the napkin guy, and like, and like the weird, like I, like, I would sketch things out, but it's always on like a scrap. Yeah, I do that, draw my bed, it's my buddy. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. Oh, yeah. Well, you guys, thank you so much for joining us today. Round of applause for Scott. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Las Vegas. Keep it going for Scott Deppie, everybody.